Okay, so um, quick exercise I want you to do in the remaining 30 minutes or so of the lecture section is um, I want to uh, calculate some example cases of um, pressure due to weight of fluid. And I guess we can do the water one right after we do atmospheric pressure because that's a useful number to know and until you kind of get used to it, it's actually a surprisingly large number. Anybody here know? So how many here have seen, so let me write down, atmospheric pressure. How many here have seen um, um, this phrase, one atmosphere? What does this phrase refer to? Or what class would you have seen this phrase, one atmosphere? You would have seen it in chemistry, right? And what this is representing is uh, it's the atmospheric pressure. So how much pressure is right now in this room? In the air. Um, now, this uh, one atmosphere, this unit is sort of the defined the way chemists define it, um, kind of how you measure it. Uh, this atmospheric pressure to just all around, and you know, when chemists first invented the barometer, they uh, assigned whatever they were measuring to one atmosphere. But it's, an, it's not really based on a fundamental mechanical concept. So, uh, oh, I never talked about unit of pressure. So, um, pressure is, you know, force newtons per meter squared, right? Um, in SI unit system, we actually give a name to this particular combination. Anybody here know the name? Pascal. This is Pascal. You know, you, if you are reading through the book, you will have seen it. <laughs> so, this newtons per squ uh, square meter is what we call unit of Pascal, or if you want to shorten it, PA. Okay. So this is the question I want to ask you, which some of you actually might know the answer to. If I want you to express one atmosphere, which I know what it is, it's the pressure right here, but I don't know how much that is in mechanical terms. I do like to express it in terms of Pascal, so that I have an idea of how one atmosphere relates to sort of mechanical aspects. Anybody here know? This might be a number you memorize in general chemistry. At least I did when I took high school chemistry. I mean, you know, if you don't have it memorized, that's fine. Anybody have it memorized? You might have it memorized it in kilopascals. Yeah, all right, nobody does. Let's just actually estimate. We can estimate how much atmospheric pressure should be. We can estimate it using this formula. So you, we would have to know some numbers. G, we know. G is a 10 meter per second squared. So two numbers we need to kind of estimate is the density of air, and we need to know the height of air, or some kind of a a reasonable measure of how much height would it be if we had atmosphere at a uniform density and it wasn't getting thinner as uh, you go higher up. So let's start out with the density. So you know density of water, 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. Does anyone have an intuition when water turns into vapor, uh, when it, liquid turns into gas, how much smaller the density becomes? Or another way to put it is how much bigger the volume becomes. Anyone here have some idea? Just in rough terms, you know. Does the volume get bigger by factor of two? Probably not factor of two. Factor of five, ten, hundred, thousand, million. Thousand. It's, this is a good round number to know. I mean, you know, I don't recommend that you memorize a lot of numbers for this class. These few numbers are ones that are worth memorizing. Density of water, it's worth memorizing. And the second thing that's worth memorizing is the typical ratio of volume of same mass of material in liquid form and in gas form. When a liquid turns into gas, a, the typical expansion factor is about 1,000. It depends on the material. If it's like helium, liquid helium into liquid uh, gaseous helium, it doesn't change all that much. But something like water, it expands by about a factor of 1,000. 
which gives us an estimate for density of air. We can say that density of air is approximately one kilogram per cubic meter. It's a, it's a surprisingly big number when you actually start calculating things. That, um, this is what this number means. You know, this is a cubic meter you remember seeing before, right? You know, it's a bit large volume, but it's not the entire room. Within this volume um, of one cubic meter, there's a kilogram of air. So you gather up all the air in this room, it should probably weigh as much as at least the sum of us here. Right? Like, you know, 50, 100 kilograms or something. I don't know how many cubic meters this would be. I don't want to estimate it. Yeah. So, so air is surprisingly heavy. When you, or there's a surprising amount of mass when you gather up enough volume of air. So the last thing we kind of have to as estimate is height. And this will be based on your experience or your earth science knowledge. <laughs> um, you have to know some re reference scales. Um, like, you know, is the atmosphere, I don't know, 100 meters high? Does that sound about right? No, 100 meters cannot be right, right? Like you go from sea level to go up a gentle hill, that's 100 meters. Atmosphere doesn't go away in 100 meters. What about a kilometer? Still not quite enough, right? Decent number of mountains are about a kilometer in height. And when you go up there, you still have a, about the same amount of atmosphere. Atmosphere didn't really go away. How high up do you have to go before you start to notice that my uh, atmosphere is not really there anymore? Fifty kilometers. Fifty kilometers. That's uh, um, in the ballpark. It's in the order of magnitude. And just because I know the correct uh, final answer that I'm trying to get at, I will give you a number that will get to that answer. So about 10 kilometer is about the uh, closer ballpark number of if you took all the atmosphere and squished it down so that it's the same density throughout the height, it would be about 10 kilometers. And the way you can remember it is, that's uh, more or less the height of the Mount Everest or that's more or less the height at which airplanes fly. And that's the height where, you know, up until recently, people thought you couldn't uh, climb Mount Everest without oxygen tank. There were people who actually did it uh, in the recent years without any oxygen tank, but in the past, we thought there's not, much, not enough air there, you need oxygen tank to survive. And, you know, if you are in um, any commercial jet, commercial jet liner which flies at this height, the cabin is pressurized. If you ever, somebody ever opens the door and there's explosive decompression, the first thing you notice is that you can't breathe anymore. That's why that mask thing drops down so that you can breathe. So this is about approximate height of air within the order of magnitude. So let's see what we get when you plug in these three numbers. Um, I better convert this to meters because kilometer is not the basic unit of SI thing. So it's a 10 to the four meter. So, oh, these are all nice numbers. One times 10 times 10 to the four. 10 to the five, make sure the units work out. So meter squared cancels out, uh, you know what, you can work out the units, it's gonna be Newton per meter squared. <laughs> so it'll be Pascals. And so one atmosphere is about 10 to five Pascal. Um, doesn't really strike you how big a number that is until you estimate some amount of force. I was having some of you do this uh, uh, demo, and you know you can play with this after class if you want. This is the demo I got about a year ago to illustrate the strength of atmospheric pressure. This is nothing special, it's just a rubber sheet. The only thing that's special about it is there's a handle attached to the middle so that I, so that I can apply a fair amount of force without lifting a corner. Because when I lift a corner, then I'm letting the air flow, the pressure is equal on both sides, they kind of cancel out. When I lift it from the middle, what I'm doing is um, I'm trying to overcome the atmospheric pressure with my own force. Because there's no air in underneath to help me lift it. So it's all my own force that's doing it. And 
you know, you saw me briefly try to lift it and it doesn't really come off. And if I try super hard at some point, it'll, oh, I, I got weaker. I could do it last semester. So at least let's estimate how much force there should be here so that I don't feel like such a weakling. Um, so what do you think this area is approximately? Well, I guess we can measure it. Let me just measure it. It's a square of about, let's say, uh, 0 0.25 meter on a side, 25 centimeters. So it's a quarter of a meter. So the area is um, 1 over 16th of a meter, okay? or 1 over 20. Let me just make it round numbers. Multiply that area to this pressure, then you will get the force. Well, it's a 10 to the 5 divided by 20. So 10 to the 4 divided by 2. So 5 times 10 to the 3. 5,000 newtons. Is that a small amount of force or a large amount of force? It's very large. 5,000, it's a weight of a 500 kilogram thing. So, I mean, if you lift this hard enough, you will actually be able to lift it. And it's not because I can actually lift the 500 kilograms. If you watch it carefully, what happened is that this uh, distorted enough that at some point it let air in. Um, but yeah, atmospheric pressure is, that much. Let me just show you one more demonstration to illustrate beyond any shadow of doubt just uh, how big atmospheric pressure is. I can do it with a balloon and a vacuum pump. I have a vacuum pump here that can suck out all the air from this glass jar. And so normally uh, we don't notice how big atmospheric pressure is because we have I don't know, acclimated to it. Um, you know, our own internal pressure constantly balances out atmospheric pressure. And you know, and when I move my arm around, I'm not lifting all the air. Air kind of moves around me. So I'm not used to actually lifting atmospheric pressures. And to the extent that it's pressing down on my, you know, all around me, my I have uh, developed body structure that already accounts for that. It's like fish living in deep water. They are used to the great pressure in the deep water. So what I want to do is, I guess, what I can show you is uh, put a little bit of air in this balloon and see if that's enough amount of air to make this balloon much bigger. So I don't really want to burst the balloon, so I should have put maybe this much. I guess it burst, it's not that big of a deal. All right, so you see there's a some amount of air in here, right? Now, this is a question. The air that's inside here, is that enough to stretch this latex to fill up the, about the size of the bell jar? Let's give it a try. Right now, you say it's not. But here, right now, what you're seeing with the balloon is that the air that's inside is also fighting against the air pressure pushing in. So what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to put any more air in it. I'm simply going to remove the air around it so that however much the air inside is pushing out will become evident just by itself. Um, so there's nothing else that I need to consider. So let me turn on my vacuum pump. You're gonna see some like smoke rising from that. Um, it's because this vacuum pump is missing a part. It's just a oil mist, it's not actual smoke. Um, it's harmless and the person who'll be breathing in it most is me, so. Uh, all right. So I'm vacuuming it up. I want to stand far because in case that jar implodes, I want to be far away from the pieces. Oh, sorry, it blocked the hole. Mm, well, mm, yeah, that's the biggest problem with this. Occasionally it blocks the hole. Let me. No, it's gonna just. Okay, so I think what I need to do is I need to orient the balloon correctly. <laughs> it's the same pressure, it's not, shouldn't be sealed. I guess um, 
so when I vacuumed it, uh, something pressed it in, and it might have got to stuck. All right. <laughs> uh, let me orient the balloon this way. That'll make it less likely that it'll roll over in a way that blocks the air flow. I really need a better equipment. Uh, all right, let's try this again. So vacuum it out. And this is actually a pretty good vacuum pump. It can go to a very small fraction of atmospheric pressure, like a hundredth of atmospheric pressure. Don't block the hole, don't block the hole, don't block the hole. All right, I guess that's good enough. Nah, all right. Let me just stop it here, because I guess it's not getting. Did it block the hole again? Um, oh, oh, what I think I can do is I can roll it over. I believe it will be safe to have it tipped over on a side. So uh, what I don't want to happen is for the glass jar to hit anything hard, because then it might break, and that would be dangerous. But I think what I'm doing is safety-wise OK. It's not tipping over enough to actually roll over. Um, all right, let me keep vacuuming it out a little bit more. Did it block? All right, all right. We'll just stop it here. Um, but you know, you can already see how much the balloon expanded. It has, you know, started out from the small volume. And it doesn't have any more air in it now than it does. What's different is that outside, inside this bell jar, has there's less air. So there's less pressure there. So the air that was originally inside the balloon was actually enough to make it expand this much. So, you know, atmospheric pressure is one of those things that it's easy to forget how big it is. Because um, in most of the circumstances, it kind of balances out. So we are used to um, thinking of atmospheric pressure as being, we are used to thinking of atmospheric pressure as being inconsequential. But it's only because in everything we do, we have already accounted for it. And in fact, this is probably a good opportunity for me to introduce a particular phrase. That's good for you to know. Um, it's not something we are going to do anything with in this class. But if you ever deal anything with the pressure, like inflating your car tire or deflating a football, then uh, this is a, a concept that's useful to know. Your textbook does talk about it. It's the idea of gauge pressure. Anybody here have heard the phrase gauge pressure? It's the difference between pressure that's measured in an absolute way and pressure that's measured as a difference. So this pressure here, this is an absolute pressure. The you know, 10 to the 5 Pascal, that's how much pressure is here. But because that's a, such a large pressure and it's all around us all the time, to say that, you know, I could tell you that there's a pressure of 10 to the 5 Pascal inside this glass dome, but that actually doesn't mean anything. I'm just saying that inside here, it's the same pressure as outside. Um, so if you are, uh, um, I don't know how much this is in PSI. Um, let, me, let me do the conversion so that I actually know the number in PSI. Um, well, from alpha, so 10, uh, 10 to the 5 pascals in PSI. Pounds per square inch is another unit of pressure that you will see a lot, um, like you know, when you're inflating your tires. So this is about 15 PSI pounds, let me write it out, pounds per square inch. And if I said that your tire, car, your car tire inside has pressure of 15 pounds per square inch right now, I'm essentially telling you that your tire is not inflated at all. 
because if you simply leave an opening, it'll, the pressure will equalize with outside, and it'll just naturally have 15 psi. So this absolute pressure, in many contexts, is actually less meaningful than stating the difference in pressure. That's where the idea of gauge pressure is useful, gauge pressure. Gauge is actually the device that people use to measure pressure. And so this is saying the pressure you would read on a gauge. And most gauges work in a way that it measures pressure difference. Pressure difference from outside to inside. So inside this glass dome, I cannot have a absolute negative pressure because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, negative force that's sucking things in, like it, you know, things only can push. <laughs> um, so, but I can have negative gauge pressure as much as uh, minus 10 to, five, 10 to the 5 Pascal. Or if I have a positive gauge pressure inside, that means things are trying to push things outside and I would have to keep pressing it. So your car tires, like my Honda Civic, it's, I think it's supposed to have 30 PSI, and it would be 30 PSI gauge pressure. So in terms of absolute pressure, it should be you know, 45 PSI. And this particular fact was um, uh, useful. A um, couple years ago, uh, do you guys remember the whole deflate gate thing where the uh, New England Patriots were accused of intentionally deflating footballs to gain an advantage? That wasn't that long ago, right? It was only two or three years ago. You guys are alive then. <laughs> no one here follows American football or football. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so there are actually um, some uh, prominent physicists who are on TV talk shows saying how physics says the temperature drop wouldn't make the pressure go down that much. But they were wrong because they were mistaking the gauge pressure, which is how the football pressure is specified, with the absolute pressure. They were using something called the ideal gas law that you will learn in physics 4B. Um, and all those uh, laws of physics, it's stated in terms of the absolute pressure. But for measurement convenience, many things are measured in gauge pressure. And you should know the distinction between them so that you don't make that kind of mistake. 